So, what if you could jump in to an animated film and become a part of the story? Would you? Uh, could you even do that? Well, I'm going to get to that in a second, but first I want to give you a little bit of background. I graduated from college with a journalism degree in 1983, and I had no idea what to do with my life. Um, but I walked past my TV, which happened to be on, and I saw something that caught my eye, and I stared, and I was absolutely mesmerized. Now, 1983, that's a long time ago. That was the year the internet was invented. Most of us didn't even know, I'm not going to say about Al Gore, I'm sure he had help, but most of us didn't even hear about that for another decade or so. Home computers were in less than 8% of the homes. Cell phones were affectionately called bricks. <laughs> and they were probably as reliable as bricks, um, maybe made for a better doorstop. The point is that technology was way less powerful and pervasive than it is today. But what I saw on that screen was all about cutting edge technology. And what it was was a documentary about computer animation. And what I saw, I didn't even know it was computers that made this amazing stuff I was seeing on screen. So crisp, the lighting was perfect, and yet it was magical. It was like a whole nother world. And I was absolutely blown away, and I knew what I wanted to do with my life. Now, it took a few years, but in 1990, I got my first job at a computer animation company in California called Pacific Data Images, the oldest computer animation company in the world at the time. And that's where I got really interested in using computer animation for storytelling. And my wish really came true a few years later when DreamWorks partnered with PDI to create feature film computer animated entertainment. And I was lucky enough to be asked to direct the very first animated film that DreamWorks Animation released called Ants. That was released in the late 90s, and then I went on to be a writer and director on Madagascar, Madagascar 2, Madagascar 3, The Penguins of Madagascar. It was a Madagascar life. Um, this was 20 years, thank you. So this was, this was 20 years of, of my career. And then in February of last year, I had an opportunity to put on one of these, a virtual reality headset. And it blew me away the way that documentary blew me away 32 years before. And I decided it was time to try something new. So last summer, me and some friends got together and we started our own virtual reality company called Baobab Studios. You may remember there's a baobab tree in Madagascar, and my partner loved The Little Prince, which also features a baobab tree, so it was a marriage made in heaven. Um, now, for those that aren't familiar with virtual reality, you do basically have a headset like this. It may have a smartphone in it, like this one does, or it might be connected to a computer. But whatever the hardware, you put this on, and you see a 3D image. And unlike a 3D movie, that 3D world exists wherever you look behind you, below you, above you, it's all around you. It's immersive, you are inside of this place, whatever it may be. And it's hard to describe, you know, you really have to try it to really understand what virtual reality is all about, unfortunately. But fortunately, probably all of you will have the opportunity sooner than later because virtual reality has applications in so many areas, from education to medicine. They're already using it to treat uh, people with post-traumatic stress syndrome and people with Asperger's disease. It's, it's really amazing what this can do. Travel, manufacturing, exploration, the list goes on and on. There's many things I haven't even thought of yet or the world hasn't thought of yet that virtual reality is good for. But we do know one other thing that it's certainly good for and that's entertainment. And that is what we're focused on doing at Baobab Studios. We want to do interactive storytelling in virtual reality. More specifically, we want to do computer animated interactive narratives in virtual reality. When you hear computer animation and interactive, you think of games, typically, right? Um, well, games are great, I love games. Virtual reality and games, a marriage made in heaven. A lot of people are working on that right now. 
but I want to use the interactivity powers of VR or virtual reality for something else. I want to use interactivity to tap into the great strength of traditional storytelling, or at least one of them, which is the ability to elicit powerful emotional experiences through the development of empathetic connections between the audience and the characters within the story. So that's a compl complicated way of describing what it's like to go to the movies. You know, you have these amazing, profound emotional experiences because you're connecting with these characters on screen. And it's the movies, it's literature, it's, it's uh, theater, all of these things, all of these media do a great job at bringing out these wonderful, profound emotions in us. It's because storytelling is really part of what it means to be a human being. We all get it. We all understand it. It's in our DNA. So before I go any further, I want to show you an excerpt from the first piece that we've done at Baobab. Um, unfortunately, I don't have headsets for everyone. Um, so we're going to have to look at it in 2D on the movie screen. So it's not virtual reality. It's a movie, right? Um, but as you watch it, imagine the possibility if you had one of these headsets on and the fact that you could look anywhere in this world and wherever you look, that world would exist. So let's watch. So like I said, when, um, when you're watching this in virtual reality, you can look anywhere you want to look. And everywhere you look, the snow is falling. And when you look down, you have the body of a little white bunny. When you bend your knees, your, your belly extends. And when you walk around in the space, your little bunny follows you, your bunny body follows you, as you would expect it to do. And when you look up at the sky, you can watch the clouds roll by. Of course, I don't want the audience to spend all their time watching the snow fall and the clouds roll by. I want them to be connected with the story and the characters within that story. And that brings us to the power of the bunny. When that bunny spots the viewer from across that frozen lake and hops over and looks the viewer right in the eye, everybody could be looking wherever they want to look, but nobody looks away. The bunny has their full attention. Now you might say, well, is this any different than a movie? I mean, an actor can look at the camera and do that thing called breaking the fourth wall. And, um, you know, how is this any different? Well, if you ask the viewer of this who's watching it in virtual reality, they'll tell you that it's very different. 
In fact, they'll tell you that it just somehow feels real. And people do things that they don't do when they watch a movie. When that bunny comes hopping over, some people like recoil, or they lean in, or they wave and go, hi, bunny, or they mirror the bunny's body language. Some people even hop around and play with the bunny. You know, the more uninhibited ones. But this, <laughs> like, this is crazy. Like, what are, why are people doing this, you know? Well, the thing is, there is no camera. There's no fourth wall. There's no walls anywhere. You are out there on the middle of the lake. And this bunny is looking at you saying, hi, welcome to my world. And if you're willing to suspend your disbelief just a little bit, you can feel like you really are in her world. And it's really quite amazing because you just feel immersed in this world. And, and consider this, there's no keyboard or mouse or game controller. You're just communicating with another living thing, in quotes, um, the way we all communicate with, you, with each other all the time, even animals. It's eye contact, right? That's one of the basic things that we do. And in virtual reality, somehow that eye contact isn't an actor staring at the camera lens. It's another character responding to the fact that you're there. It just feels natural. It just feels real. And for the more primitive neurons in your brain, I suspect it is absolutely real. Now, the, there's a point in the story, as you saw, where, where the bunny runs and hides behind you. And, you know, in the, in the piece you saw, basically we just turned back and kept our eyes glued to the aliens. But, of course, you can look back and see the bunny behind you, like, cowering, and looking at you, and looking back out at the aliens, and back at you, and she's clearly terrified. And people have these remarkable reactions, they tell me, to this moment. Like, this one woman took off her headset when it was all over and said, that was so weird. I said, what do you mean? It's like, she said, when that bunny, like, got behind me, I, I didn't expect this, but suddenly I felt this surge of empathy, like I really cared about the bunny. I didn't want her to get hurt. I, I wanted to do something to, to protect her from these bad aliens. It was so weird. And then um, another guy said, when that bunny you know, went behind me, I looked at her, and then I looked back at the aliens, and it was strange because I could feel the bunny's presence behind me, even though I wasn't looking at her. It's almost like I could feel her breath on the back of my neck. Well, he was standing in our office, so what I think he was probably feeling was the air conditioning. <laughs> but, and you know, so here's this guy, you know, this 60-year-old man with dorky-looking headset on, standing in my office. But in, in his experience at that moment, he was out on that frozen lake, and there was a frightened bunny behind him, breathing on the back of his neck. And that bunny at that moment was more real to him than I was. So, this is the power of the bunny, which is a metaphor for the potential power of virtual reality, to give us a chance to experience a great story, well told, with characters you can fall in love with, but not secondhand, not from a distance, to actually be there with them, living those moments with them, which gives you the opportunity to have even more profound emotional reactions. Now, think back to cinema again. You sit in a dark theater, you stare at a rectangle into a world that you can never be a part of with characters that have no idea that you even exist. And yet, the most stoic people suddenly find tears streaming from their eyes. You know, an entire audience will gasp in unison. Lovers clutch each other's arms and children call out for their mothers even though their mother's sitting right next to them. I heard a kid do that in Bambi. Mother? <laughs> I'm right here, dear. Um, and then when you think of my films, well, what if you could actually be a part of them? What if you could be an ant in the ant army, marching next to Z, talking about the dangerous termites you're about to go to battle with? Or what if you're a zebra that lives next door, and your best friend is Alex the lion? Or what if you're a penguin, and you, you've got a bunch of other penguin buddies, and you're on a mission to save the world? Or anything else that you can imagine. The virtual reality, I believe, gives us the possibility to essentially live our dreams. So, where is this going? Admittedly, I'm being a little hyperbolic today because the technology and what we know about virtual reality is just so primitive. We have so much to learn. You know, for a VR creator, 
there's a whole language to discover because VR isn't just an extension of movies. Movies have their language, and that's different than theater, and that's very different than literature, but they're all serving this higher goal of storytelling, something that's been around for thousands of years, and like I said, is in our DNA. And virtual reality will have its own set of tools that need to be discovered that can then also serve that higher goal of having a great story well told. But then, instead of just watching it secondhand, you get to experience it. And the technology, clunky as it is today, will get better and better. The headsets will get smaller and more comfortable and lighter. The resolution will get better. And the field of view will get wider. And we'll be able to start interacting with the other senses, not just your eyes and your ears, so that you feel even more immersed in these imaginary worlds. And for those familiar with Star Trek, at some point, those headsets will go away entirely. There's already people working on this technology right now. And we will have our version of the holodeck. Now, the original Star Trek series, which is the one that I watched, um, you know, with Shatner, um, that took place in 2266. Well, we're not going to have to wait until 2266 to have our version of the holodeck. Um, I believe it'll happen in my lifetime, probably within the next couple of decades. So this is why I'm so excited about virtual reality, this potential to change the way we think about storytelling and to change the way that we experience stories in a way that allows us to be a part of that story and to live that story. This is the future of virtual reality. This is the power of the bunny. So what do you say? Are you guys ready to jump in? Yeah. All right, thank you very much.